This week we're in a place most of us think of as the childhood home and burial place of Princess Diana. For 500 years, the Spencer family have lived here at Althorpe in Northamptonshire, and it's stuffed to the rafters with treasures. <laughs> When a family has spent over 500 years in one house, as they have here at Althorpe, you can expect a bit of high quality clutter. And with various ancestral members of the Spencer family being fanatical collectors, come and take a look at the priceless paintings, china, furniture, and books. George Spencer went a bit book mad, amassing one of the country's finest collections at a time when the printed word was a sensation on a par with today's internet. Around 40,000 tomes tussled for shelf space at Althorpe during the 18th century. George's obsession became so extreme, he almost bankrupted the estate. Frederick Spencer was a seafaring man, rising to rear admiral of the fleet. On his voyages around the globe, he collected an armada of fine china, as well as a flotilla of homegrown treasures. His aim was to collect from every manufacturer, and the third earl spotted another treasure at a time when the British Navy was fighting for supremacy at sea. He's renowned for giving a certain Horatio Nelson a heave-ho up the ranks. If there was one Spencer who outshone the rest, it was Robert. Politician, traveller, society man, and one who thought the arts were a good little investment. In the 17th century, he launched one of the best private painting collections in the country, there are currently over 470 portraits peering down from every nook of Althorpe. The Long Gallery contains the most impressive of Robert's collection, including portraits of the elegant ladies of the court of Charles II, where Robert was an influential ambassador. The Spencers afforded all this as landed gentry, sheep farmers to be exact, so parkland and stylish stables took precedence over formal gardens. But this doesn't detract from our setting as Althorpe welcomes the Antiques Roadshow to their lawns. You know, this is one of my very favourite ceramic pieces. Oh, good. The mice watching the Punch and Judy show yes. at the seaside. Have you ever watched the Punch and Judy show? A long time ago, oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> a I long time a ago. I, I, I love it even now. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, and the, one chap is grab banging the drum, to, yep. drawing customers in, and there's even a chap collecting the money. Yes. <laughs> and one little chap has got behind, so he's not going to pay. He's looking, <laughs> looking back through there, wondering what the hell's going on. Yeah. And uh, how long have you had it? It must be about 30 years, I would think, at least. Yes. It was my father's. Was um, it? I can't actually remember how it came into the family. <laughs> and you like it? I do, yes. <laughs> yes. It, it makes me laugh. I think it's hilarious, but I, you know, The usual model is by George Tinworth. Um, but the extraordinary thing about this, it's got the normal um, Dalton Lambeth mark. Uh -huh. And the date, uh, 1886 which is the date that this was actually made. But instead of George Tinworth's mark, you've got John Broad, JB, uh -huh. which is terribly unusual. Um, George Tinworth did the modelling of it, but he went a bit funny in his last years, yes. and John Broad finished off his models, mm -hmm. and so hence JB is the mark underneath. Oh, They're still quite a collectible little model oh, and quite right. valuable. Have you got it insured? No. No, uh, it's just on the ordinary... You know, household oh, contents. I think you should go home and insure it for certainly a thousand pounds. Goodness me. <laughs> oh, good old dad. <laughs> good old dad. <laughs> That's Absolutely. the way to do it. Yes. <laughs> this is what it says on the tin. It's called the Kenora, and it was the very first type of home entertainment. 
Now everybody has home entertainment, but this was developed in about 1908. Goes right back to the very early years of cinema. Invented by the Lumiere Company in France in um, 1897 or 1898, and then imported into the UK. How it worked was that they had reels of film that, to give persistence of vision, they flicked by very quickly, mechanically, and here we see the boat race. And you get an image of movement, I and mean, it's just photographs taken very quickly one after the other, and then uh, put onto a reel, and you turn the handle, and it produces this effect of motion. It must have been amazing back in the Edwardian times. Oh, absolutely, yes. Was it a family piece? Or? Yes, uh, and it belongs to my husband, and um, when he was a child, an uncle passed it on to him and been played with through the generations, non-stop. Well, that says something about something that is it a toy, is it an amusement, is it for children, is it for adults? It's something that can continue. Oh, it's for, for all ages, isn't it? For a hundred years, and it still amazes me today. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what, what films have you got with it? Um, well, there's ten altogether. Um, can't remember them all off by hand. This is the boat race. And I think it's King Edward the Seventh. Um, and there's one of the Kaiser's visit. And your favourite? What's your favourite? Uh, well, the one of the King and the Queen, I think. Um, King and the Queen, I think. Okay. Could be this one, is it? Let's have a look. Oh, there they are. I'll just have to take this one off and put the other one on. Now, I think it just clips off like that and pulls off. And then the new roll goes on. Put it round and then give it a wind. Okay, this is your favourite. You should. I'll do the winding if you do the looking. If I do the looking, okay. <laughs> and tell me what you see. Oh well, I can see the. There's the yes, guards on either side. side. Yes, you can obviously see better than me. And the, oh, and the Queen is following up at the rear, isn't she, um, with the King? Yes. And the crowd's and going past. And, and a yes, close-up of the Kaiser. And well, he, he gets... was on the visit as well then, was he? Yeah, and the King. That's right. And it's finished. That's fascinating. <laughs> as to value, um, they are very rare. Um, they weren't made in large numbers, and because they're something that is very tactile and children want to play Maybe. with forever, um, they can get damaged and ruined. What's so nice to find is that you've got it in good working order, you've got the boxes, you've got the labels, and it's up and running still. At auction, very desirable. People who collect photographs want to buy them, people who collect early cinema want to collect it, people who collect cameras want to have them. Um, one turned up at auction not so long ago, and with this number of rolls, it's between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. Gosh, is it? Goodness me. I just spotted you in the queue with these books. So you've just had them valued. They're, were they Wainwright's, Wainwright's books? Um, yeah, they're the first edition copy of Wainwright's um, Eastern Fells. And just remind us, for those who aren't familiar with, with um, Wainwright. Well, he was a really keen walker and he wrote about all of his walks all over the country and a lot in the Lake District. So this is his first book about the first set he walks. Were you inspired by these books to do the walks yourself? Um, yep, yeah, definitely. I started off walking all these walks when I was quite young, seven or eight, with my parents in the Lake District. Um, and now I've gone into even bigger and better mountains. <laughs> so have you done some of his walks? And he, um, there's seven, yeah. aren't there, that he's... Um, I've done nearly all of the ones in the Lake District, um, and I've moved on to the Seven Summits, and I'm halfway through my challenge to climb the Seven Summits. So I've done Africa, South America and Australia, and I'm off to Russia to do Elbrus, the highest mountain in Europe, and then on to Everest, hopefully, in a few years' time. So this is what inspired me to start them all. So it's all down to Wainwright's walks? Yeah, all down to Wainwright's walks. So thank you, Mr Wainwright. <laughs> One of the assumptions one makes uh, when people bring things to the ridge is that they've had them for a long time. It's a sort of old family treasure or whatever. How long have you had this? Not very long. About so, well, fairly recently. And did you pay a lot of money for it? Well, yes, I paid quite a lot for me. Right. I usually pay about £35. That's, that's your, your limit, is it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so, so how much can we ask? I paid £500. Paid £500. Well, um, it's signed here, Raoul Dufy. Yes. And Dufy was uh, born in Le Havre and uh, is particularly well known for outdoor scenes, uh, either beach scenes in the south of France or at Deauville, races at yeah. Deauville and this sort of uh, thing. Lots of outdoor life. 
His early career was uh, very much influenced by the Fauves, who painted uh, they were the wild beasts, who painted in bright colours and bold outlines. And although he latterly moves towards these rather more subdued tones, it's very typical of the kind of palette and style that you would expect of Dufy. And uh, Dufy was, I suppose, perhaps never absolutely top flight in terms of uh, French post-impressionists, but clearly had a very good clientele of um, the, 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 the wealthy who went on holidays to uh, lovely places like Deauville, Longchamp and, and the south of France. And I suspect he was regularly selling to those people who were on holiday there. D did you know it was Dufy when you bought it? I mean, well, it's... I hoped it was. I thought it was a lovely thing and done by somebody who really knew what he was doing. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and he, he dies in 1953, so we're only five years off, yes. off that, and, and it, it is pretty sketchy. Um, I suppose what's going on here, we've got a... She is a busker, I suppose, is she, do you think? I think so. And, and they're queuing up for the theatre, perhaps, because there's a, a, a poster there. I think that's fantastic, the way he's caught every one of those people without doing anything very much. Exactly. Well, I mean, I love... You know, she's obviously paying attention to... Yes. The, but Whereas this chap's paying absolutely uh, no attention no. at all. He's obviously far too well, bad. Well, he's a man, isn't he? Oh, is that what it is? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So we now know where we stand. Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, the very fact that it is a sketch, I think, is... Uh, it would be lovely to know whether there's a, there's a worked-up version of it. Yes. And I think this is where we need to go next, is... With these uh, French artists of the, of, the, of the 20th century, there is a, um, a need to be in the catalogue raisonné. So, in other words, you need to have it accepted by the, the current guru on uh, Raoul Dufy. Yes. And they need to uh, check the paper, they need to relate it to other known sketches and so on, all of which are things that we can't do today. However, let's make the assumption that it is OK. I think it would fetch at auction today somewhere between eight and ten thousand pounds oh well that would be nice <laughs> so uh, quite a good turn <laughs> yes yes well welcome to the great unveiling you must be wondering why on earth on this beautiful day this sensational bit of walnut is covered up and the reason is that now it's nearly 300 years old it's George I period, it's about 1715, 1720. It's obviously been kept out of the sun, it's never been bleached, and so you've got this rich, lustrous timber, just like honey, which has got all this texture in it. How is it that it's stayed in such fantastic condition? Well, I don't really know. It's, um, my father inherited it in the 50s. It came from a house in Amptill. It was stored in a coal shed, that may be one contributing In a coal point. shed? In a coal shed, yes. In fact, when it came to my mother's house, my mother didn't like it because she, she, she uh, thought it smelt. Well, she knew it smelt because of the <laughs> residue from the coal house. But uh, my father had a dealer come to look at it and he offered him £60 pounds for it. So my mother was uh, changed her mind about it and uh, lovingly uh, uh, cleaned it and looked after it. What's so fascinating about this is, is the sheer refinement. So you've got this lustrous figured walnut all framed with this double herring bone feather banding here cross banding again and then double feather banding again here before the moulded edge. And then even more refined are these rather sort of Chinese inspired re-entrant corners which are not only at the front but also at the back which is yeah. the sort of thing that you very very rarely see. It's incredibly refined from the detailing and that you know incredible picture on the top is carried on right the way through so even on the sides you've got the same recessed moulded edge to give it that little bit of lift, that little bit of shape to it. All the way down to the bottom, you've got cross-banded sides, these vertical veneered panels, which are mirror matched on either side, so they match each other all the way down. Mm. And it's in just really wonderful, untouched, loved condition. When you open the drawers, you can see that it's a beautiful, dry colour. There's no signs, telltale signs, of any earlier handles. They're the original brasses. And even when you look at the knee hole, which has obviously had a little bit of um, woodworm coming through at the bottom, you've got this simple architectural arcading, which is then matched on the sides. But what makes this one, apart from its incredible colour, so different is actually when we open this top drawer. Because instead of it being just a plain drawer, it has this fitted dressing drawer, writing drawer, with all these wonderful compartments. This very distinctive checker banding, again, the re-entrant corners echoing the top. All these boxes, which all 
come out, the trays, the pen tray, the ink, the sander, and then, of course, this ratcheted space where you could store your more secret papers inside. And even with little drawers with their original little lacquered brass handles on the inside. So you've completely made my day because it's one of the best bits of pure walnut I've seen in my life, actually. We do see these a lot. There are a lot of them around, and they tend to be worth four, five, six thousand pounds, depending on how much restoration there's been. This, however, is such an exceptional one that this is more like a 40 or 50 thousand pound piece of furniture. Good heavens. It really is exceptional. Thank you. When we think about the railways today, and I travel a lot by train, yeah. it's easy to forget how things have changed. Um, shields like this really take us back into the heyday of the railways, as I would view it, without any romanticism. It's just that it was such a major industry. Well, um, it was I think enormous. It employed hundreds of thousands of people, yeah. and it was an industry that was very much concerned with people's lives. And I like things like this because they bring to life all those forgotten people. What's your connection yes. with these? Well, I used to work at Paddington Station from the age of 15 mm -hmm. to about 1967. Right. 67. And I was given the job of clearing out the old British Railway Staff Association in Bishop's, Bishopsbridge Road, Paddington. Yeah, by that, round the back I was chucking station. all this paper out into a huge skip and I found these in uh, the heap, as it were. So I thought, well, they're too good to throw away. So, just... so I went to see my governor and he said, well, take them home. Yeah. I, I've had them out at home and I've lived in London ever since. And... Right. We all know about station garden competitions, but that was just the tip of an iceberg. What we've got here is this one I'm holding is the award shield for the British Railway, or Great Western British Railways, public speaking competition. Yeah. And it went on, according to this, till 1953. Can you imagine, every year, a competition is announced all over Britain, people are yeah. practising their skills, yeah. I'm going to win the competition, yeah. writing their speeches, and they go to this, one can imagine, the final, and that moment comes when, yes, you know, Somebody you won the you shield. Yeah. And can you imagine today something like that even existing? No. And there were sporting societies, there was everything to do with life, yes. in a general sense. Yeah. And this one is another aspect of life, temperance, really important social movement in the late Victorian period. Well, you know, drink was the curse of the working yes, classes and yes. all that. And the railways, of course, were dangerous places if you were drunk. Mm. And so temperance was encouraged. And this is mostly, I think, Welsh uh, depots and branches. And presumed again, there was a competition yeah. to see who to can win, win the shield. Yes. And you can imagine them bringing it home in triumph, saying, yeah. we won. And this went on all through the network. And so, even in your time, this was still going on. Yes, the British Railway Staff Association was big. It had its own magazine, and it was all over the, West, the railways. Hmm. What else was thrown away? You know, one hates oh, to think of I, the things that were gone. Hmm. Most of it was files and paper. Uh, a lot of the old railway posters that you see up in the yards, you know, go to York or let's go to Bournemouth. Well, they're, they're worth a bob or two now. Yes, uh, for no end of that away. Well, what have you saved? Well, in value terms, you know, these are bits of history. They're not going to be hugely valuable because mm. they're not... I mean, if you'd saved, ironically, if you'd saved the posters, yeah. they'd probably be worth more. You know, those <laughs> yeah. bits of printed paper you the throw away posters, yeah. would, be, would, be, would, would be very desirable. But, you're, but these things are still going to fetch, I would say, between 150 and 250 pounds each. So mm. you did all nice. right. Yeah. But it's not about the money. It's about the fact that you have brought back to life this lost period. Yes, so and uh, I'll, I'll keep it as well. Keep it and enjoy it. Yes, I will. Think of all those people standing there yeah. doing their speeches. And all these people must have descendants somewhere. They've got their family somewhere, yes. yes. Exactly. I know I shouldn't say this, but I was a deprived child. No, I was. <laughs> because all I ever really wanted in life was a budgie. And, and, uh, and I, I never really did get one. Frogs, yes. Budgies, no. <laughs> but you've got some rather nice budgies here, haven't you? Mm. Yes. Um, and um, I, I'm intrigued to, to know why a, a little piece of uh, La Belle France is lurking here in Northamptonshire. Well, uh, all I can say is I inherited it from my mother when she died in 1992. Mm -hmm. And really didn't know much about it at all. I always loved it. She had it lit up on the piano. How did, you, how did she light it up? I got a fitting to go inside it. Oh, I right. bought that. 
So it looks very nice lit up. And, and so you've got a fitting that lights yes. it up. And oh, does yes. it have another bulb above? A bulb in and above and below, yes. Uh, for a lampshade that yes, goes above. Yes, actually, I got that too. And it has the magic name attached to it. Yes. And the magic name is under the basin. Do you want to tell me what that magic name is? Well, I, I know that, Lalique. Lalique. Yes. Yeah, René Jules Lalique. Yes, that's right. Uh, the great man himself, uh, born in 1860, yes. uh, becomes France's great premier jeweller by 1900. Uh, by 1910, he's uh, getting a bit bored and he moves into industrially produced uh, glassware and he becomes France's great glassmaker. Well, uh -huh. certainly great glass designer. And uh, this is one of, one of my favourites anyways. It comes under the title of Perouche. Now, to tr truly appreciate this vase, you've got to see it illuminated. The best I can come up with at the moment is to take it up there and to actually pass light through it. And as you can see, it's just becomes a different vase, doesn't it? Yes, yes, it, it does. Is. Much lighter, actually, um, with light permeating through. Made in a steel mould, by the way, with pneumatic air that pumps the glass into the mould. Um, this would probably be made in Vingen Samoda, which is where the Lalit factory still is today, and they're still using the same sort of techniques. Um, we'll have a look at the mark, because it's, it's more a seal of approval <laughs> than anything else. Um, and there it is. It's an engraved mark, R. Lalique. You would expect the R, um, because during his lifetime, as I say, he died in 1945. Uh, after that time, you find things are simply signed Lalique. Is this something that you personally like? I just love the vase. Um, I just remember coming in um, and seeing it in a cabinet and I just fell in love with it straight Did away. Um, for the birds and the and the colour, it was the colour that sort of struck me, so I absolutely love it. Now, have you, has anybody ever valued this for you before? Uh, probate, about 1500, I think, it is 92. 92. Well, I can tell you now that the, the Lally market um, is way up one minute, way down there. It's, it's, it's a roller coaster. Mm -hmm. At this moment in time, your vase is worth, um, in the marketplace, I can tell you, at least £8,000. Amazing, yes. Well, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's probably nothing to you people in Northamptonshire. A mere but, drop in the ocean. But I can tell you, this would be big in Burnley, without any question whatsoever. <laughs> now, I reckon there'll be quite a few of you at home thinking, Althorpe? Althorpe? What's the right way to say it? Well, I don't know, but I know a man who does. Lord Spencer, thank okay. you for welcoming us to your home, first oh, of all. It's a pleasure. What a great day for it. And how do you say it? Well, I don't want to be sitting on the fence about this, but both are correct. Um, my father used to say all thought, my grandfather all trip, and it's because a long time ago there was no standard spelling, so it was spelt all trip at one stage, and I'm quite relaxed about it. I've given up the fight, but I will. There was one American correspondent once who called it Antwerp, and that was definitely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so you happy for us to call it all thought? I am, whatever you prefer, yes. Well, it's certainly a fantastic venue and a very impressive Thank house. You. It is stuffed to the gills with extraordinary, priceless artifacts. Mm. You brought along a couple of them which mean quite a lot to you. Tell me about yes. this one. Well, this is a bust of Napoleon, and I was always brought up to believe that it was his own personal possession that he gave his doctor, a man called Omira, when he was a prisoner on Elba, and that this base is made of marble from the island of Elba. Now, that's a family folklore that's come down to me, and I honestly don't know if it's true. And if you had an expert who could help me, I'd be delighted. Do you know, I think we could sort you out with that. <laughs> Thank you. And, and what about this painting here? This is a very curious painting. It's by a, a lady called Sophonisba, Angus Cola, and she was um, a professional portrait painter in the 17th century in Spain. And she was one of four sisters who painted. And I remember as a child, this used to give me sleepless nights, this painting, because there's she playing a, a harpsichord or the equivalent. But who is this? You know, people say it's her nurse, but I it looks like a ghostly presence, and it still terrifies children when they see it today. I, I find it a fascinating portrait. It is quite spooky, that, isn't it? Yes. And we don't know who she is. Well, people said that maybe there was another painting underneath and it's a separate thing, but, but the, the, the common view is that she is meant to be in there as a presence, but it's just, it's such a, a bizarre look. Yes, and she looks quite stern and quite scary, yes, doesn't yes, she? Yes, yes, no, she does really. I've got a godchild who won't come and stay with me because of this painting. <laughs> so. Oh, dear. Maybe you could turn it to the wall <laughs> yes. when your godchild comes along. Yeah. I mean, what was it like growing up? you know, here in this extraordinary house with an, such an amazing collection of paintings and, and, and china and furniture that you've got there? Well, 
I know it sounds ridiculous, but I think anywhere you grow up is home. And of course I knew that it was different to most of my friends' homes. But it's a sort of, um, it's something you get used to. And to me, I remember growing up, the most interesting objects were not the Rubenses or Van Dykes, but it was uh, a chest of drawers which had a secret drawer in it where you could hide some coins. That was much more interesting than the very valuable pieces. And you're, you're, you moved here with your father in 1975. Correct, so so yes. you and Diane were there sort of in this enormous house. I mean, are there particular parts for you and your sister that had special memories or that you particularly loved? Well, mainly outdoors. I always think the real privilege of living here is the park. It's so beautiful. It's such a classical setting. And yes, it's full of treasures, and we're very lucky that my family collected them through the generations. But to me, it's this English parkland that's the real joy. And both Diana and I are quite outdoors people. We spent a lot of time out. Do you feel the weight of history on your shoulders in this house with all your ancestors? And I mean, it's been in your family for 500 years. I do in a way, but also um, I try and uh, enjoy it and make sure my family enjoy it. And uh, I have added to the collection slightly uh, with half a dozen paintings by Edward Burrow, who's a 20th century um, British painter. So should we try and uh, find out a bit more about well, this Well, that then? would be one family mystery sold if we can manage it. We'll see if we can sort it. Thank you very much. When I look at a ring like this, it looks fairly ordinary. It's a misshapen blob of greeny blue on a yellow mount with engraved detail on the shoulders and, frankly, not a particularly inspiring ring, hardly a flashy diamond. Do you feel the same way about it? Well, I just think it's an unusual sort of coloured gold, really. It looks like a soft gold. It does, doesn't it? Because it is gold, yeah, yeah, we should say. Yeah. How long have you had it? We've had it for like, the last couple of years because it was handed down from my husband's mother mm -hmm. who had it from her mother. So we can trace the history of it as far as you're concerned back to... My what, husband's 19, grandmother. So 1900, 1890, yes. yeah, 1900? Yeah, before that, yes. Mm. When you brought this in to me and showed it to me, it quickened my heart. Really? <laughs> because although the ring doesn't look very inspiring, when you find out that the ring itself was probably made in the year 1350 to 1400... Really? It puts a slightly different tangent oh, yes. on it, doesn't oh, yes, it? Definitely. The age of this ring, in my opinion, goes back to the era of Richard II, Henry IV or really? Henry V. Let's just look at the stone itself because it's a slightly triangular shape, cushion shaped stone. Oh, yeah. The surface of it, typical of the period, isn't faceted, it's polished en cabochon. Yeah. So it's just like a, little, a small sort of um, rounded bead, bead almost. Yeah. What I think it is, is a rather dark blue irregular sapphire. Really? And it's gripped by one, two, three little claws. If you look inside the back of the hoop, it's got three little words engraved in it, just there. What are those words? Alas for faith. Alas for faith. I wonder if the word is fate. Alas be. for fate. In the old sense. English, yes, yes, you know? Yes. So you've got a ring here which I think you can call a love ring. Oh, right. Now, I'm not going to go mad with this because I think that the market for something like this is extremely specialised. Oh, I would right. also say that in the normal practice of these things, one does show them to museums just so that you can substantiate them yeah. because clearly they are one-off pieces. I think it's got to be worth three to five thousand pounds. Really? Really. I cannot see it being worth less than that. Really? Having said that, I wouldn't be surprised if someone was willing to pay more for it. Oh, right. Try and find one, <laughs> going back to yeah. the days it's probably one off. of Henry V. <laughs> yeah. It's a lovely day for going fishing. Yeah. Uh, are you a fisherman? Well, I used to be. Um, I used to go with my father-in-law, and this is when uh, he unfortunately passed away. This was passed on to me. And um, you keep it because? Sentimental. Right, good. You know, uh, good, a good reason. <laughs> yeah, we used to go fishing every weekend. I, I have to admit, I'm no fisherman. Yeah. But what I like about this piece is yeah. it's got this very nifty patent device 
This is a turn bit of bone, which is the handle, obviously, for winding. And then when you finished, you could just turn it to this notch here, turn it round, and then screw it up, and it's completely locked. Safe keeping. Safe keeping. Yeah. The other thing I love about it is the inscription. And it says, A.G. Wilson, fishing rod and tackle makers to H.R.H. P.A. Prince Albert. Yeah, that's what I thought. Edinburgh. Yeah. So he was a great fisherman, yeah. great sportsman. Lovely to have that inscription. Yeah. Quite a collector's piece. Yeah. Any ideas about value? I took it to a shop in Northampton and they said maybe 50, 60 pounds. But why did no you, idea. Why didn't you take the money? Don't know. The reason why is because it's worth five to seven hundred pounds. Holy. <laughs> Fantastic piece. <laughs> didn't know that. Now we go fishing. Ah, <laughs> uh, I think that's going back in the cabinet. Great. Lovely thing. I, 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 very much a collector's piece. Look after it. Thanks very much. Thank you. I gather there's some sort of question about this, uh, th this piece here. What's the story behind it? Well, the story is that in the um, 19th century, my family sent various people to collect items from France, some of which I know were genuine. We've got Marie Antoinette's uh, chocolate service here. That's genuine. Mm -hmm. But there's another painting which is meant to be Mary Queen of Scots, not genuine. This is, a, this is from the same sort of shopping expedition, and we don't know if it's real or not. And uh, they bought it in, in, in France? They or? bought it in France, and, and the story was it was sold as uh, uh, Napoleon's own property. Napoleon's own property? Yes, and he gave it to his doctor right. as, a, as a thank you for looking after him on Elba. Well, I suppose, gosh, at the risk of slightly debunking that, I, in a sense, uh, it's quite possible, but it's a bit like pieces of the True Cross, too. Mm. One just can never be quite sure how many pieces there were and, and how much Napoleon had and how much he gave. I mean, the, the stone, I, you, it, the story goes that it actually is the stone from Elba. Yes, which I have no idea. It's not typically Elba stone. This mm -hmm. is Giallo Antico, which is a, a, an Italian uh, marble. Right. So I think it, I mean, it, it is possible, but I think it may be that he had it rather than it came from Elba. I see. I, I think, you know, that, so, so it's not entirely wrong, but it's not entirely right. I can take it on the chin, because every day that we have an expert <laughs> here, something gets a good rap and another one gets debunked, so I can, it doesn't matter. It would just be fascinating to know. Well, I think, and, and the quality of the bronze is fantastic. I mean, it is a really good Paris bronze of that sort of period. So, I mean, you know, it, there's no, it's, it's not, that's not wrong. Mm. Um, I'm quite sure of that, but I'd just be slightly doubtful that the, the marble came from Elba. Okay. That having been said, if it didn't belong here with such an interesting provenance, it would be worth two or three thousand pounds. But with such a wonderful provenance and a great story too, and perhaps a little bit of myth, it would be worth considerably more, I think. Oh, well, that's but uh, but I, sadly, I don't think it is Elba marble. That's fine. Well, there we go. Well, thank you very much for looking at it. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you've brought me what looks like, if you don't mind me saying, a rather, rather sad little <laughs> copy of A.A. Uh, a. Milne's House at Pooh Corner. Is it a first edition? No, I don't believe so, no. It's not? No. <laughs> What's special about this, then? Ah. Uh -huh. There's a letter written to my uncle from A. N. Milne. They formed uh, a Winnie the Pooh club in 1950 at Cambridge University, and these are all the members. And they wrote to A.N. Milne, and he wrote a letter back to my uncle, Ted Wright, and this is the letter. And it's an adorable letter. So this is in A.A. Milne's handwriting? It is indeed, yes. And what age would he have been then, about, do you think? He, um, it was after the, after the World War, after he'd fought in the World War, so. He'd so in he, his 20s, I believe. Mm. He'd be in his 20s, so yes. what I'm getting at is, he, he was a grown man. He was indeed, yes. And he was <laughs> with a group of other grown men mm -hmm. at Cambridge University, yes. at Jesus College, and they formed themselves into a, a poo club. A poo club. They did. And so what did they do in the poo club? I'm not absolutely certain, but I know they had Winnie the Pooh ties with Winnie the Pooh on. And maybe Winnie, Winnie the Pooh dinners, Winnie the Pooh meals? Well, I would think so, yes. Expeditions, yes. outings? Yes, they had an expedition to the North Pole, <laughs> on the river. <laughs> so they, from the they, banks. From the banks of the river. Yes, they did. River Cam. They did. Indeed. To the North Pole. They did. And indeed. How long do you think that took them? Uh, not too long, I don't think. <laughs> Back into the bar. Yeah. Straight afterwards. Let's have a look at this letter. It's lovely. It's dated 
the 10th of July, 1951. Dear Mr. Wright, many thanks for your letter and news of the Poo Club. This is funny, look, he says, he says, you seem to be in a highly intelligent lot. But then, of course, I had guessed that. You must be. Good luck to you all in your botanical, zoological, therapeutical and historical researches. And in brackets, he puts words which have always bothered Owl. <laughs> so that's lovely. What's lovely about the letter is that it's, it's not just about a bunch of students, grown men, may I say it, having fun. Um, it also mentions uh, one of our best loved characters in the Winnie the Pooh books. And that always makes a letter from an author that much more interesting. <laughs> and he signs it, yours sincerely, A. A. Milne. Of course, Milne wrote a lot of letters. Lots of people wrote to him and he was very good at getting back to people. Um, so there are lots and lots of A. A. Milne letters around. I suppose they're not rare. Um, but one which has such an obviously just amusing content as this, as this must have some kind of value. Uh, I would say for the letter, around a hundred pounds. The book, I'm afraid, is not going to be worth anything like that. Um, but you do have all the signatures of the Pooh Club, which is wonderful in mm. itself. Now, this sword may look in miserable condition, but there's more to it than meets the eye. Yes, Now, indeed. tell me, tell me. This was dug up on the battlefield of Naseby about a hundred years ago by the family of Mrs. Jane Schofield, who has denoted it to the Naseby Battlefield Project. We, we, we are hoping one day to have a museum in which we can display it. Really? I mean, you know, look at the condition of it. And of course, excavated on the battlefield, what could you expect? Now, this is a cavalryman sword. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine perhaps Rupert's cavalry. I'm not sure whether Rupert was around in that battle. He was he indeed. Was, yes. was he? Was yes. He? yes, very much so. But that was about the 14th of June, wasn't it? Or I think so, 1645. Around. And mm -hmm. of course, Naseby is only about 15 miles away. So Less, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're in that area. We can't Wonderful. actually tell whether it was Rupert's or Fairfax's because <laughs> the artifacts are spread all over the place. <laughs> and we don't know which side it came from, but it's definitely mm. one of the other. You see, it's lost about 10 inches or a foot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then again, by virtue of the fact that it's, it's broken, suggests it might have been done in action. Uh, so can you imagine what this would have looked like in, in pristine condition? Really, really great. You can put your hand in it, and there you are, cavalryman sword. Some people are inclined to think these are Scottish, but of course they're not. But they are basket-hilted Civil War 17th century swords. Of course, if this was as it should be, you're looking at a sword worth thousands of pounds. Mm -hmm. But even in its relic state, um, a collector would pay something like a thousand pounds for it, because right. for what it is. Mm -hmm. We're putting our experts on the spot at the roadshow and asking them what two items they would grab if, God forbid, they suddenly found their house was on fire and they had to make a quick exit. Now, Philip, paintings obviously are your thing. Not surprised we've got a beautiful painting here. But what about these things here? Well, you're looking at, uh, Fiona, a pair of 18th century shoe buckles. And when I was about 12 or 13, I started collecting them. Uh, in when fact, you're 12 or 13? Yeah. You know... <laughs> Most boys when they're 12 or 13 <laughs> are kind of more into other things than collecting shoe buckles, I've got to say. Well, the point was that they were cheap and they were rather interesting. They reflected the status of the individual uh, according to what material they were, reflected back on how rich you were, and indeed, at one point in the fashion, they became so big, aristocrats wore things called artois buckles that they were normally found on the floor after a ballroom dance. They were about half a pound each in weight. <laughs> I wrote articles on them and um, I got my dad to help me do a booklet on them called the English Shoe Buckle. Well, all this while you were still at school? Well, when I was about 17 by now and uh, my buckles were really uh, playing for me. In fact, I went on um, Kids TV with uh, my collection of buckles. Became a minor celebrity in the North West. So you were a shoe buckle entrepreneur? How <laughs> or a shoe buckle nerd? <laughs> One or the other? <laughs> Shame on you. How did you go from that to this? So, I basically, I thrashed shoe buckles to death. Um, sold my collection when I was about um, 18 or 19. In fact, it was a dedicated sale in one of the minor <laughs> London auction rooms. Just, you know, the shoe buckle collection. And with the proceeds of that, I started buying art. 
And tell me about this. Well, Thank this you. is this is this is my favourite picture. I mean, I really would brave the smoke and the heat to get this. I mean, after I'd got my family out of the house, clearly. Um, this is by Sir Peter Lely and is the first sleeper I ever bought. A sleeper being a, a, a painting, um, most often a painting, that passes miscatalogued through the auction rooms. I was just getting going. I was about 23. I had learnt about 10 or 15 portrait painters' styles, so I had them in my head. This came up, catalogued as Circle of Sir Anthony Van Dyke. In other words, an artist in that vein, but not necessarily Van Dyke, far from it. I picked it up for a couple of thousand quid because I identified it as a work by Sir Peter Lely. Many examples in this house here today. Yes. And uh, the point is, Lily's real name was Peter van der Fees. The English couldn't pronounce it, too much of a sort of mouthful. So they called him Peter Lily after Lily carved on the gable of his house. This is one of the most arresting, beautiful examples of romantic art, before romantic art pretty well existed. In a time of bland portraiture, you've got a sweet, arresting couple of children about to sing. And you picked it up for how much? Now, I'm, I ask those sort of questions. You picked you it up can't for what? Say that. <laughs> it's my turn now. A few thousand pounds. And what would it, what's it worth now? Um, well, I'm almost embarrassed to say it's worth about three hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Wow! Now you've made. I know. Wow! <laughs> I mean, you've made a bit of a name for yourself as a, as a sort of art sleuth, picking up sleepers, haven't you? Well, I mean, I get it wrong a lot of the time as well. But um, what I do is I specialise, I and mean, you get to know a bunch of artists, rather like you get to know the handwriting of your friends. You know, you can recognise them on the envelope before you even open it. And as a result of that, you know, fortune favours the prepared mind, and I'm prepared for these guys, and I know what they are, and we've got a great team of people now, and we do it across the world. Well, I think we'd better get a security guard to set you home with this one. <laughs> Thanks, Philip. Pleasure. It's Jenny Lind, yes? Yes, that's right. The Swedish nightingale. Mm -hmm. She came over to England as a relatively young woman, born in 1820, and caused a sensation like you wouldn't believe. We think today of rock stars making millions. Jenny Lind went to America and her tour made her three million dollars. Wow. That was back in the <laughs> mid-19th century. The other thing I like about it is that it's Parian ware. Mm -hmm. Now, Parian ware was a Victorian invention and lent itself perfectly to making busts like this. Mm -hmm. It's a hard paste porcelain variant and it would take the most fantastic detail. And here we've got it on this figure, apart from her face, which is actually very attractive, and female busts are much rarer than male busts. Really? When we turn it round, we've got Mademoiselle Jenny Lind and the date 1847. Uh, we've got Copeland, the manufacturer. We've got uh, Durham up here, the uh, sculptor of it. And what is my third special reduced by? Right, what Not... does that mean? Ah, well, there we are. <laughs> this was probably made, carved as a marble bust this big. Yes. Mm -hmm. There was a portrait done a couple of years earlier which, of her, which may well be the source for this. Yes. So the guy mm -hmm. sculpts it. Mm -hmm. And he takes a pantograph. Do you know what a pantograph is? Mm. It's a sort of a lot of wooden bits which all do this. Mm. And you run it over the marble bust mm -hmm. and it produces a small one in clay. Oh, right. It's a brilliant system. Mm. And that's how this has been, mm. been produced. Where did it come to you from? Um, well, it was my grandmother's. Many years she had it on her mantel, mantelpiece at home. Um, she tells me that it came from her, either her mother or her grandmother. I'm not quite sure. She, My grandmother died a few years ago, so I can't ask her now. But uh, I believe it was given to her um, by her employers as a leaving gift when she was in a service. Right. And that's as far as I know. It's possible. I mean, one has to say that this story about being mm. given while in service, mm. one hears quite a lot. Mm. Um, and what it usually means is that they nicked it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then it comes down to the family as a mm. gift. I was afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be true, no. but it might be. If, if it were to come up for sale, obviously it's not going to, but if it were to come up for sale, you would have two lots of people bidding for it. Mm -hmm. um, you would have the Parian people mm -hmm. and you would have the opera 
bunch. Yes. Uh, the opera bunch, by and large, have got far more money. Mm -hmm. um, but I can certainly see it making three to five hundred pounds, mm -hmm. and so maybe even a bit more. Yeah. It is yeah. a rare bust. So can we open the box? You yes. certainly can. Aha! 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 Two lovely, lovely dolls. Now tell me, did you buy them for your wife? I did, yes. You yes. did? Yeah, I did, yes. What a lucky wife. Mm. Tell did me you know about what it. she said? No. I don't want them awful things. <laughs> <laughs> but I think she's changed her mind since. Why? Why have you changed your mind? <laughs> well, I've been going... going I've grown used to them, I think, now, but I thought, oh, a bit tatty, aren't they? <laughs> that's a terrible thing to say. Yeah. How can you say that's tatty? <laughs> Look at that. It's wonderful. Well, it's fantastic. <laughs> now, they are a pair, but mm -hmm. so often would have been made for twins. Oh, would they? And, yeah. and sometimes you find them in, in a glazed case with sort of butterflies and... Uh, and roses and all sorts of things oh, yeah. behind them as, mm -hmm. as a not to play with, but oh, right. just um, yeah. as a decorative piece. But oh, they right. are in such good condition. They're papier mache, the head mm -hmm. and shoulder plate, papier yes. mache oh, with this right. incredible hairstyle. Um, <sighs> totally a, the, the style and fashion of the 1830s. So well over 100 years old, okay. like um, nearly 200 years old. Really? Um, the only things they're missing um, are the lower arms. Yes, yeah. Um, they've got their lovely little feet. feet yeah. And the original clothes, mm -hmm. their bonnets, which are silk and satin, and yeah. their little um, sort of adornments of lace and... Yeah. Look at that. Just yeah. look at that. Good Lord. Yeah. You've never tipped that up, you see. Yeah. No. So mm. I think this is the original box. Were, were, were they in it when... They you were in it. it. Yes. That's the yes. box they came in. Yes. Right. And, right. And what did he say, this man that sold it to you? Well, they belonged to his sister. Yes. And um, all he knew was that they'd come down the family and he said they'd been in the family for over 100 years. Mm. But I can't really tell you any more than that. So if it belonged to his sister, why was he selling them? Well, because she wanted to sell them. Oh, right. um, and I, I made an offer for them, and mm. they accepted it. And uh, would you mind telling me what you paid? <laughs> Try 150 pounds for the for two. three. For the two, well, for the three. Actually. It was another one, you see, <laughs> which I had repaired. Maybe that's why you didn't like them so much. <laughs> <laughs> if I told you that you add a naught for each one, not just the two, so we're talking about a thousand to fifteen hundred each. No. Would you no. like them a bit better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I'll have them back now. <laughs> <laughs> no. <clears throat> he said I didn't Don't get any. That makes sense, <laughs> did it? Oh, what? Mm. A thousand fifteen hundred pounds each. Each? Yeah. I thought you meant the two. <laughs> so you went on a fishing trip, but you came back with more than just fish. You came back with these. Yeah. It's, uh, it's my local spot I fish, because it's only half a mile walking distance to where I fish. And so I just gathered them up, took them out. In a fly tip? Well, a disused yeah, tip, sorry. yeah. A disused tip. Fly tip, whatever you like yeah, to call yeah. it. The, the contents of a fly tip. Yeah. Do, do they all come together as a group? Yeah, yeah. So we can yeah. assume safely that they're the same person's pictures? I it's would, blown... I would think so, by, yeah. By the Somebody same had a... Clear yeah. out of the attic, I should think. Now, have you thought who it might be, this person who dumped these pictures no, next to where you fish? Not a clue. Not a clue. <clears throat> well, let's see if we can find out something about who they might be by the pictures. So we start here with a little print by Sir Joshua Reynolds. That could be anybody who had that in the uh, yeah. 20th century. It doesn't mean much. The one above is a bit more interesting. That is a German copy of a Raphael. But the fact that it's by a German is rather interesting because it must have been bought on the continent. And then above that is a 19th century drawing. Again, continental, not English. These are travellers, perhaps. Yeah. Above that is a rather curious print called the Jamaica Exhibition. Now, I wonder why that is the case. Jamaica. Perhaps they travel further than the continent. And indeed, we've got here a view of where Columbus landed in the Bahamas. 
So we're getting a rather um, worldly family here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Do you have a favourite amongst these? No. If I did like anything, I think it would be that. The lady with the hawk? Yeah. Have you thought what these runs around might be worth? Bring in here, that was all. Let me whip through them. <laughs> I think the print's worth about £10. Yeah. I think the uh, German after Raphael is worth about um, two or £300. Not bad. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> I think the drawing here is worth about hmm, £150. The print is worth what you can get for it. Um, and this rather delightful watercolour, uh, we know who the artist is. It says it's here. Mrs Blake. Blake, I'll uh, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it seems to be a dot between the two, but it doesn't matter. I haven't heard of her as an artist, but it's getting us closer to the watercolour above. I'd put this at probably two to three hundred pounds. Yeah. Now, the watercolour above is most interesting. Have you actually reflected on what's written in the bottom right-hand corner? Never looked at it. Have another <laughs> look, then. <laughs> I've never looked at it. Well, there's a signature. Winston, is it? Winston? Winslow. Oh, Winslow. Well, I can't read it. Well, the next word is Homer. <laughs> yeah. Winslow Homer. And Winslow Homer is about the most important watercolourist at work in America in the 19th century. Yeah. So clearly, this travelling family, who were getting close to where Winslow was working, and indeed, I think at one point he was working in the Bahamas, have got hold of a work by one of the leading artists around. Yeah. He was an amazing painter. Uh, he was an impressionist, he was an illustrator, uh, he travelled on the continent, uh, but basically he's claimed by the Americans. He's one of the great artists who define um, American art heritage. When I first saw this watercolour, I thought, hmm, I'm a bit disappointed by the look of that. The colours look a bit strange. And then I thought, well, actually, the faces look a bit disappointed. But then when you study them more carefully, you can see that this is an illustrator who's got a most beautiful finish a clarity, trying to impart information, not just about people generally, but about the situation, what's going on. There seems to be a box of gold or jewellery or something that they're discussing. Almost certainly this is painted in Cuba, yeah. which is where the artist was working. If it were in really, really good condition, it would be one of the most exciting pictures I've ever seen on the roadshow. But it's not, unfortunately. Tell me, did you catch anything that day? Only a flat flounder that was spent. <laughs> <laughs> How big was it? Uh, could have been a specimen if it wasn't spent. In other words, it had spawned. Right. Yeah, that, that would have been a bear it, I think. That would have been my only luck other than picking them up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you netted something else that day. You've got a picture worth up to £30,000. <laughs> 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 Bingo. Well, that's nice. That's lovely. <laughs> you don't have to cry, my <laughs> duck. It's yours. <laughs> it's yours. Let me also break some bigger news to you. The fish that got away. If this watercolour were in really good condition, you'd be talking about something worth £100,000. Handle that. <laughs> Now, for all of us coming to this house today, both us and people like you, inevitably we think about Princess Diana, and I thought at first we might get lots and lots of things relating to her connection with this house. But, in fact, it hasn't happened until this moment. And here we are looking at two very, very, very iconic, very familiar drawings of dresses that I think we've all got in our heads. Mm. I remember them. I expect you remember them. And you just think, my heavens, what on earth is this? They're signed by R. Corley, um, and I'm just amazed to see them in this context. But tell me how you fit into the story. Well, Richard's my uncle. Richard Corley? Richard Corley is my yeah. uncle. And he was working as part of the design team at Belleville Sassoon when they designed these. He drew the pictures that were sent to her for approval, and at the same time drew uh, an exact replica, which he framed and set up like this to give to his mum, my nan. Very good. So this is the second set. The first set, who knows? I mean, mm. It might be with Belleville Sassoon, it might be in there. Who knows? Yeah, she had them to look at. She yes. had them to look at. So let's look at the process. I mean, Richard Corley, what I know of his background, he was a, a trained fashion designer. He studied in Paris. 
he went to Walthamstow, a very famous school in the fashion industry. What are we talking, 60s, 70s, I imagine? Yeah, late 60s, yeah. I think. Yes. He then went to Royal College. He then worked for Belleville Sassoon and had quite a long relationship with them. So this was, I mean, Princess Diana was obviously a prestigious client, but she was obviously the only one at that time. Yeah. I mean, I know him, actually, not as a fashion designer at all, but as a, a TV chef. Yes, yes. And writer on cookery books. He obviously went through one of those sort of change of life. And at that point, he gave up fashion, didn't he? Yes, yeah, well, just did uh, odd bits for his mum <laughs> and things like that, yeah. Now, yes. let's look at the drawings. I mean, what we've got here, therefore, is everybody remembers that dress. That's the going-away dress after yes. the wedding. It's yes. dated July 81, signed by him. And, you know, you'd know instantly what this represents. It's that very stylized type of fashion drawing. It's a drawing to sell the dress. It's not about how to make that dress. No. You know, fashion drawing is about persuading your client to buy into that idea. Of course, yeah. When they say, OK, we'll go for it, you then take it home and say, Work out, how, how are we going to make it? it? <laughs> and that's a quite different technical exercise. This yeah. is a selling drawing. Yeah. And this is what fashion houses did. I'm interested that it carries his name. It doesn't carry... Belleville for soon, so he must have been quite senior within that organisation to have that. He must have met Diana several times, then presumably drawings were sent in for approval yeah. and they would be approved or not. And the other one I think is equally famous, although perhaps less familiar, because that photograph was there so much. Absolutely. But this is the one for Christmas, the first married Christmas. That's isn't it, it? Yes, yes. And this is a, a, a coat and matching dress. So this is embroidery or what? Yes, yes. They, um, there's a. I know that they made Belleville Sassoon made one design, which Prince Charles decided wasn't quite dressy enough for Christmas. For Christmas. Um, so they, with 14 days left to go, they designed another one. Right. And uh, so they were a bit short of time. And uh, Richard actually did the embroidery that you see there. He did that himself. On yeah. the actual dress? On the actual dress. Because yeah. he'd been trained as an embroiderer, has <laughs> yeah. he, or what? An A-level from Doncaster. <laughs> well, you see, A-levels are useful in the exactly. end. They always get you yes. somewhere. I think this is an extraordinary story because it shows the emergence of a look, an image. You know, Diana had to be packaged and presented in a way that not only made her acceptable to her family, into which she'd married, but acceptable to the public. I think that is the more famous dress. Yes. We all knew that one. Yes. I think that to a Diana collector is going to be £2,000, wow. possibly even more. This one a bit less because it was a more personal dress. It wasn't a public dress in mm. the way that that was. And I suppose I'd say 1500 to 2000 for that. These are to do with the launch of that, that princess. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. There comes a point at the end of the roadshow when we could all do with a cuppa. But I know two people who are in urgent need of hot sweet tea because they've had a bit of a shock. Haven't you? With this painting, yeah. a very yeah. nice shock, valued by Philip Mould, for quite a lot of money. I mean, what did you think? We're having a time to think. And <laughs> all I can say is that uh, we can't believe our lot. We don't like the picture. It will be sold and restored, or restored and sold. And the daughter and the grandchildren will benefit from it. Very nice, too. So well, we'd hopefully. like to follow what happens to it if we can. Well, you can, no problems, and it won't cost you a penny. Oh, <laughs> you don't need a penny <laughs> no, now. No, it won't cost you a penny. Well, it was certainly worth you turning yeah. up. And we've had a glorious day here at Allthorpe. Wonderful sunshine, some great finds from the roadshow. Bye-bye. <laughs>